Welcome to our Composecast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? Doing well. Actually, I just got lost in Vivaldi here, but I figured it out, you know, opening up our news feed here, uh, taking a look at our news. Have you used yeah. the, um, the RSS plugin? reader for vivaldi vivaldi chrome i'm sure it's been ported to firefox as well nextcloud actually also has an rss aggregator uh, application that you can use as well uh, i'm i'm hoping that we can start using that to share some of the feeds of our projects uh, with each other i'd be interested to look at that nextcloud integration uh, i think it would I, I don't know. I want to get more into NextCloud, that NextCloud ecosystem, especially based off last week's chat. Absolutely. And RSS is one of the last bastions of the federated internet, um, along with email um, and yeah. some of the Web3 tech we're going to talk about today. And um, I am super excited to get into that later. Uh, if, if you don't mind, let's just go ahead and roll right into the news and the community updates. Yeah, go for it. Uh, what, do you ha- what do you have this week? What do we have? Sure. So I, I took a couple of things that I wanted to catch up on. Um, I didn't want to go very far back. I think I took them from about the last month um, and, and simply the notable ones that I wanted to cover. So um, Firefly 3, which is a financial accounting application that we host, released a update recently. Uh, it was 5.2.8. And the developer made a very interesting decision in that they implemented opt-in telemetry for the individual instance. So the quote from the developer is that, My hope is that ultimately, these kinds of statistics help me really get to know how everybody's using Firefly 3. That is the exact legitimate reason that you would implement telemetry. And I think using opt-in telemetry like this, not only one, respects people's privacy by not turning it on by default, right. but two, can also provide very important feedback for the developer that you would not get from a, uh, a survey. A survey is always going to have a bias over or under representation of different functionalities. Right. I would love to be using functionality X but I'm not. But if I say it in the survey, then maybe the developer will push that forward more or or something along those lines when realistically it would be more important to you if Y function functionality Y became better or was improved or, or had a better turnover. Maybe, maybe by doing that you'll have the time or the, the mental capacity to deal with X feature. I really like the uh, the statement that he made. I started Firefly as a way to, as a I started Firefly way too long ago as just a me thing, but the real treasure is the friends we made along the way. Aww. Well, maybe no, but I'm humbled by all the attention and support. So <laughs> it's something that's you're often you have to opt out of. Yes, absolutely. it's enabled by default. Yes, but I'm glad to see that someone's finally doing opt into it. And see what features are used. It's so. the right way to implement telemetry. Absolutely. And, and telemetry, like any other technical issue, is is very gray. They are there are definitely two sides to the story. There, um, I can I can see both, and I wish them the best of luck in in implementing this in a secure, responsible manner. Our second news item here was a blog post released by the Jekyll Project. Uh, the open source framework for blogs and podcasting platforms. In fact, it's the one we host ours on right now. Uh, that their version 4.1.1 was released. There were two lines in this that caught my eye. Uh, the first excerpt is that these seemingly benign changes had unexpected adverse side effects, which did not figure in our tests. Hang on. Unexpected averse side effects, which did not figure. Wait, that that probably just means they didn't write tests for their <laughs> for their production <laughs> code. That's what that says to me. That's see, that's that's how I read it. <laughs> Nothing against them, uh, and and they do go into detail. So they had a bug, and all of that to say that they had a bug, and they admitted it right in not so many words. Real quick here, it looked like it was that four point one point zero release that brought in the bugs. Essentially, it was that page excerpts and liquid drop. 
Yeah, this release introduced the fixes for that. Those right, bugs. right. Another line caught my eye in that uh, the excerpt being another known issue with page excerpts is that the infinite loop is created in certain use cases, such as any construct that involves iterating through site.pages directly within a checkable page instance. That's kind that's of dangerous. A, that's a bad bug. Uh, especially for someone that like us who who spins up that Docker image, because that means that it could be hanging infinitely, right? While it's building, right? That's one of those bugs where you have much less hair on the top of your head. No offense, Jack. At the oh, end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, once you figure out what's actually going on. The, our last news item here is from July first, so about a week ago. Rundeck three point three point zero became available. This brought with it several new options. One that's that's important to us is that the Docker base image was updated to 18.04 LTS. Yeah. That's very, very good news. I'm not going to say it's overdue, but that release was is two years old. Uh, the last bullet point here uh, that I wanted to hit on was that their new log viewer now has a light and dark theme option. I thought you were going to mention that as the most important part there. It's very high up there. Now, I do have dark mode turned on by default in my browser, so it doesn't necessarily affect me. Uh, But it it is good to see that trend. I remember in one of the Linux Unplugged podcasts uh, that is put on by Jupiter Broadcast, and I would definitely recommend that podcast if you haven't heard it yet. One of their episodes was a prediction episode. They predicted by that at the end of the year 2019, something would ship with a default dark mode. Linux has been doing that for a while with the Cinnamon desktop, but one of the interesting things was I, Mac OS has a- I'm using that now, yeah. Yeah, it has a a prompt uh, at the very beginning uh, to set up a light or a dark theme. Still think light theme has been winning for a while and continues to dominate the market. Uh, However, I am, Happy to see some of the dark creeping back in. Uh, The other feature of the log viewer is that URLs are now able to be crafted, which link directly to specific lines in the output. I'm excited about that. So I can finally point to a line and say, hey, it looks like something's busted here. And, you know, link directly to that as opposed to, I think it's in this area. Do we want to roll into our composed developments? It looks like we have... uh, two here on your side with tooling and infrastructure you want to kind of dive into those sure absolutely i wrote a couple of playbooks to do some very important things one was a teardown playbook to tear down specific instances and we were able to tear down um, different test instances that we threw up and wanted to to try stuff out on Um, so having that is going to make our day-to-day development a lot more agile and a lot more robust as well. The other one is a restoration playbook for when you tear down and you did not mean to tear down. If we wanted to restore it, we now have the option to do that from any one of a number of different packup points, including snapshots and file system level restores. Uh, So I'm very happy to see that uh, come together. That was that was really fun uh, to put together as well. We have been for a while looking to upgrade our personal documentation as well as our public documentation so what we did is we doubled down on our infrastructure documentation offering uh, which is bookstack and jack's going to talk about that in a second here Um, we also put up in our public documentation placeholders for all of the services that we currently support as well as upstream links to all of the documentation and repositories for these services. So I'm very happy to see that starting to come together and we'll be interested to see where Jack would like to take it uh, in his discussion on Bookstack. So Jack? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the uh, documentation there. Why, why do we document things? Essentially, the way I look at documentation is uh, organization. You know, you, your brain can't hold everything. So you have to write stuff down. You have to hold stuff. You have to hold information in a way that is, I guess, important and meaningful and it's easy to index for you. Uh, a lot of the value of documentation kind of comes from being able to reference something, reference back to a point or a topic. 
Uh, along with documentation, you kind of get who's responsible for what um, during parts of the process. Not everybody's going to do one thing the whole time. Um, a lot of that, especially in, I'd say, a bigger organization, you have a lot of split responsibility and shared responsibility. What do you think about living documentation? Love it. it n so necessary. I can't tell you the number of times I've walked across this document that's from someone referenced from, you know, 2000 eight or something they're like oh here's the most updated procedure and it's like what it's 2020 <laughs> you expect me to use that well uh, it, how do you how do you prevent something like that i'll tell you what my biggest gripe is that people use the old documentation and they don't update it mm. they just so if, as an example you know you have documentation that's from 2000 or wait or whatever don't tell me that the last time someone used it was 12 years ago fine it might be good you know, it, you might have a process that's worked from 2008 to 2012, then fine, that's okay. But if it needs to be updated, there's no reason not to update is what I would say. Over time, systems change. And unless you're working in the closed system, you're going to have to update documentation as procedures change. Are you aware of the term tribal knowledge? Have you heard of that? Yet? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Almost, almost no one in our field what, hasn't. What, uh, isn't that job security? It's often used uh, as as a word that's analogous to job security, but it is not. It is absolutely not. I've seen more people fired for withholding information. For withholding information, right? Or How just doing that? stuff yeah. off the cuff. I've seen someone get yeah. walked out because of that, and it's sad to see, especially when they're good at their job, quote unquote. But if you can't work in a team, you're not going to make it in this field, right? right? And Absolutely. documentation is essential for a team, even if you have tribal knowledge, even if you're the most personable, you know, man about the office, right? You're going to have to make sure that you have documentation. I think you have some really good points here. Um, as to why we need some documentation. I'd like to, to hear your takes on those, and I probably have a couple questions as well, too. Yeah, the, so I work in a pretty regulated industry here. So for us, a lot of it is compliance. We have documented procedures that actually get updated and reviewed. Uh, along with that, I think stand, you, you know it's important to standardize. Those are the two, two big things that come to my mind here. And then obviously training new employees is important. Onboarding is only gets easier with the documentation you know it's easy to just point when you, rather than answering a million questions you just point to someone and say here read this look through the whole thing if you have questions at the end ask me one of my important takeaways here from documentation I, I that i really like that i took away I, i'll have to link the uh, blog post to it i don't know where it went um but documentation needs four things uh tutorials it needs how-to guides. It needs explanation. It needs technical reference or open source projects, especially. I need these four things. I think you brought up uh, the Rust documentation in the beginning, and that you, it was organized kind of like a book, but it was was it, would you say it's like a tutorial as well? Is it like all three of those almost? Yeah, you know, it's a tutorial with technical reference, ex how-to guides, explanation, everything. You kind of read it and you go through, and you can kind of take away all four from that. You know, doc good documentation when you see it. Most, I'd argue most bigger open source projects have that grounded documentation, as I'd say. Most of what is offered is covered. Uh, a lot of the smaller projects, I'd argue, you know, maybe it lacks. And maybe, you know, that's where that's where opportunity for contributing is, though, is what I'd argue. I'd also say that, you know. It's, yeah, what do you, what do you think about contributing to open source documentation? Love, love it. Best way to get involved with the pro, you know, besides adding features, it's an easy way to just drive-by pushes drive-by commits i'll tell you what i updated i i did a drive-by uh push to a uh, repo for documentation for a ruby one because what they had in their documentation unfortunately was incorrect and out of date so i had to say hey it looks like this is out of date using this gem right now and what you had wasn't working so i i think it's an easy way to get involved Especially if you see something that's broken right on the read, right on the readme there. Unfortunately, you can get stuck with the uh, stale projects or the you know some no one's maintaining the repo. Fine, that that's a discussion for a different time though. Okay, real quick in the book stack here before we kind of dive into that is the way book stacks organized. Um, you have your shelves, books, chapters, pages. Pages being the lowest level. Um, chapters is chapters and books kind of just being titles and holders for content essentially pointing to your pages there and then above that you have your shelves which obviously are going to hold your books to start with the basic premise 
I mean, a, a book is something that's made to read through from the start to the finish. Sure. Now, that's not to sure. say that dictionaries don't exist, right? Right. Any kind of good documentation tool should be able to be used as a reference material. Any kind of wiki, any kind of tutorial is always going to be at its core. It's always going to have at its core that ability to be a reference material, right? So that Absolutely. doesn't necessarily swing it one way or the other. I was looking at it kind of like in a hierarchy kind of way. There's like that, There's definitely that hierarchy, but there's definitely a, a top to bottom a, flow okay. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Yeah. So I think it, it does treat itself, per its namesake, much like a book. On the other side of things, our internal documentation, also based on Bookstack, has a lot of very flat books. And by that, I mean it doesn't have any chapters. All it has is pages which allows it to be more like a wiki where it's one giant category and underneath that one category is all of the documentation. Now, that's to say, though, it is still hierarchical. Uh, a, a wiki such as Wikipedia doesn't have a, a overarching container, right? It, it has little flat files everywhere that interlink to each other right and i think this has a distinct hierarchical structure to it that that lends it to being pushed towards one end of the spectrum which i'd argue for a business is kind of the documentation you want and need sure if you had flat files pointing all over the place it'd become a nightmare you'd have your business documentation pointing to you know technical references pointing to this pointing to that i think it'd be very easy to get lost if you had that flat structure uh do we have any closing notes on that I would I would be interested to hear you read off the three paragraphs that you wrote. They're meant to be read. They're not meant to be written. Exactly. So read them. The principles of storing information within Bookstack is based off the ideas of a normal stack of books. Just like books, Bookstack books contain chapters and pages. Uh, you start off by creating a book, which acts as the highest level of categorization. And then ideally, you'd want to separate your books into your separate topics. Within a book, you can directly create pages or you can create chapters. Chapters provide an additional page of grouping to keep pages organized, but they're optional. All the information you write is held within pages. Although books and chapters do not hold information, they can be given a short description to assist with searching and visibility. Once you start to stack up books, you can start to use bookshelves to organize your books. And then obviously bookshelves can contain multiple books and a single book can be placed upon multiple bookshelves. Now, that last point that you made, I think is where I'd like to to bring it back to the middle to say that a single book can be placed on multiple bookshelves. You have to be smart about how you categorize things. As an example for us, we have our internal documentation, we have external documentation. Our public documentation, that's what you go to when you hit compositional enterprise.rcompose.com slash bookstack. In our internal documentation, we have configuration settings that are specific to how we run the instance and how we manage that instance. What this last point allows us to do is slowly open up the things that are internal. Right, we're, we're able to expose some of our books and some of our chapters that don't necessarily need to be private. Um, that, that could be beneficial if they were made public for a more technical audience. I'm actually looking forward to doing that with Bookstack, and I think that last point really does make that uh, possible. How do, you, how, how do you want to sum that up? Documentation. It's valuable. I could not agree more. <laughs> That uh, those are my closing thoughts. I don't know. No one can hold th that much in their head is what I'd say. You can't hold all the information in your head. You have to write it down for reference or for reference. But uh, with that, do we want to hop into ooh grab bag Web three? What do you, you know about us, Web three, Jack? You want to get us started on that? I I certainly can. Um, I I know you've gotten a chance to read this, but what's your what's your take on this? I don't, my take is the decentralized web. Okay. I, I know that's a quote right from the first line there, but I immediately jumped to that. Yeah, that's a great place to start, Jack. So the quote that I have from the Web3 technology stack website is that Web3 is a vision of the serverless internet, the decentralized web, an internet where users are in control of their own data, identity, and destiny. 
I like that. Another one is from the Web3 Foundation, where they say they believe in an internet where users own their own data, not corporations. Global digital transactions are secure. And online exchanges of information and value are decentralized. So now we get to, why do we need a 3.0? Why isn't this good enough? Well, uh, there's a couple concerns that we have writ large about the technology in our lives. Uh, for one is the content monetization, which is an interesting duality in the sense that your content can be copied and your content is being monetized by others. How is that possible? How can it be easy to replicate something, yet it is important enough and valued enough that people are trading value for it that they are that they are paying for it, that it's being monetized there's a there's a distinct level of ownership that is not very well defined in web 2.0 uh, which brings me down to my next point is is data ownership right so your your data can be snooped on but your data is subject to only be displayed on a permissioned basis if i want to be able to share something from one service to the other the chances that I can't are astronomically high because that's just not how web 2.0 is set up so data ownership is completely borked data permanence next keeping keeping on the data track here right your data is not promised to be around forever and recently in 2018 myspace lost all of the music that it maintained all of it all of the music that it maintained from 2003 <laughs> to 2012 in a botched server migration. Oh man! Now, if hey, I'm, at least they were upgrading. If, well, I hope they were upgrading. <laughs> yeah, maybe from CentOS three to four. Like, maybe. oh man, brutal! <laughs> Body slamming them right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're if I'm MySpace, I might not really bemoan the loss of that data. It's probably just costing me money, anyways, to maintain. You know, and and, and all story all's well that ends well. Uh, it was a it, several tracks i think several million tracks were able to be recovered uh or or half a million something like that crack out uh, the tape yeah so there's now it. there's a link in the show notes to a Hire site a where you can just browse this random collection of of music <laughs> that my that has been recovered from the myspace <laughs> i love it loss. Oh, that's hilarious yeah um so but but yeah, that, just to reinforce the fact that your data is not promised to be around forever, even in these big companies that you think are going through all the best practices that have their routines set up, that have their documentation up to date, it can still happen. It can happen to anyone. And and the corollary to your not your data not being promised to be around forever is that hyperlinks are not promised to be around forever either. And you know, in the web 1.0 days. And even the early 2.0 days, I mean, hyperlinks were everything. Being able to to hop around between websites, I mean, it, if if you've ever gone on the dark web, you know what I'm I'm talking about. You just follow uh, links around to to different places where you'd never figure out even existed previously. Um, search engines kind of got rid of all that. They they took on the ridiculous task of trying to index everything the internet the internet you, which is growing exponentially but it's also shrinking in a sense that sysadmins are turning off their old blog sites right i mean a, a, a bots migration happens and you no longer have a link to the your band's cool song back in 2005 which probably wasn't that cool but whatever don't oh, worry come about on it. <laughs> how can you say that so this, this this idea of not only data not even being yours and, and you having control over it, but it, it's not even promised to be there when you need it. Right. How is that even possible? How is that even possible? How is that, uh, how is that allowed? Given that we have impetus for change, given that there are some real issues with what we have today, what are some ideas that we can use to create something better? Let's see what projects are coming out of here. So number one, obviously, it's going to be Bitcoin. Um, that that oh, yeah. was that's been the biggest thing to come out of this. Uh, it, if we go back to the first part of this discussion and talk about one of the tenets of the Web three Foundation's 
belief systems. They believe that global digital transactions should be secure. This is a problem that's been around since the birth of the internet. I mean, what's money on the internet? PayPal tried to solve that. PayPal, once again, though, is a centralized service. How do you solve this in a decentralized way? How do you solve this in a secure decentralized way? And not just the blockchain technology, the underlying guarantees that Bitcoin gives us. If you've ever gotten a chance to go read the white paper, I would, if you haven't gotten a chance to read the white paper, I would definitely recommend it. It's a seven page double space. There's a lot of pictures. Uh, it's, it's very readable. And it really got me thinking the first time I, I went through that. There's some really cool things that could be done here. Obviously, the implementation right now is lacking. It's lacking a lot, right? It's lacking Absolutely. speed. It's lacking scalability. It's lacking polish, I think, more than anything. But I think there's, there's an underlying concept there that cannot be ignored uh, that decentralizes the exchange of value in a way that has never been done before. Uh, the next is IPFS. So we're talking a lot about data ownership. IPFS is interesting is in it in that it attempts to move the thin waste of the internet. Uh, and if you've taken a look at the internet, you have protocols on top of the IP, IP layer and you have protocols underneath the IP layer that can all be used with the IP layer. But the IP layer is the quote unquote thin waste. It's it's the one transportation it's the one transportation mechanism that is common throughout all internet technologies, right? What IPFS purports to do is shift that up to the contract to the content addressing space. Um, there's a lot of things going on with uh, cryptographic hashing and different ways of decentralized storage that IPFS is using in order to decentralize the ability to to retrieve information and to to access information. Um, one of the interesting things about IPFS, by the way, known as the interplanetary file system, right, is that content is addressed by its hash, not by its URL. So if I were to take down rcompose.com today, you could not access it. Right, maybe through the Internet Archive if they care enough about us, but otherwise, oh, I would hope. I, I, oh, I would we'll hope. see. But yeah, otherwise, right. no. Otherwise, we would be lost to the world. What IPFS does is every piece of information that's put on the network is addressed by its hash, uh, by its unique uh, combination of letters and numbers that is a representation of the content within that piece of information that's able to be accessed whether it's hosted by me or whether it's hosted by jack or whether it's hosted by facebook whether wherever right wherever it's hosted as long as you can find the information that matches that hash exactly you'll be able to retrieve it and it does it in a way that's a lot more reasonable than a high level overview can give it does it in a way that's scalable in a way that's fast and secure and resilient uh, but what it allows for is almost a decentralization of networks wherein if I have a content or if I have a copy of the entire Internet, I can go entirely offline and still access all of my information on the Internet simply by that unique addressing scheme. Right. If I were to talking about the interplanetary part of this, if I were to go to Mars, I wouldn't have to wait five minutes for a satellite uplink to Earth to get, you know, my Facebook Your feed. Data, right. Yeah. Right. I would I would be able to access it locally, right? And as well, everything local, talking about local communities, everything local is going to be a whole lot faster than anything that's super remote. So the the impetus to create and sustain communities is there. That's something I absolutely look for in a piece of technology. Um, and and it allows for um, incentives um in order to store that information so i think it's a very well balanced system it's very interesting uh let's see next up is is matrix uh jack and i use matrix in the riot client fairly extensively for our communication uh regarding the the project we're working on and it is an irc replacement right so it's a chat replacement 
Matrix, our main form of communication here that we use. Yeah, it's a federated chat system. Uh, one of the interesting problems that it has to solve is making sure that, one, everything always gets through all the time and that it's in a timely manner, um, especially considering that it's chat. I mean, you have people going back and forth like they would be talking, right? This is a, meant to be in synchronous form of communication you need that reliability and you need it instantly and, and i think they're making huge strides towards codifying a lot of the technology that had been tossed about and hypothesized about uh, they're really putting that to the test i think more more so than anyone else um, ipfs and matrix uh, work together very closely and I, I'm I'm just excited to see all of this this innovation happening around this project and getting getting different protocols. Uh, one of the feathers in Matrix's cap is that it it is now used as the main form of communication for the French government. They have they have deemed it to be to me, meet their criteria for a secure communications channel. So do they host? Now, here's a question you may not know the answer to. Do they host their own servers? Think about the reliability for that. I mean, you're hosting your own servers at that point. Well, and it what has, you're I able mean, to do, what you're able to do, right, is you're able to have an well. offline network per se, right? Right. right. And, and in Web 3.0, the word offline takes a whole new meaning to it, right? Because if I'm communicating on a, it's almost like a closed circuit TV. It's still TV, but it's closed circuit. You're not going to get ABC's The Bachelor on it. You're going to get oh. the security feed. <laughs> Yeah, right. You're gonna get the security feeds from your camera. I mean, it's still right. it's still the television TV, technology. Right. I think the main advantage in this case was that they did not have to rely on anyone else to provide their communications. They were able to provide themselves their communications. They didn't have to go through Facebook Messenger through a centralized service. They know that they're running their French government network. Right? No one else has access <laughs> to it. Right? That's that's the the crazy cool ability that a decentralized uh, project can can get us. Um, next, Nextcloud is so Nextcloud actually provides federation between instances, um, and this is simply a rudimentary implementation where if uh, Jack and I both have instances, we can connect them up, we can grant them the correct permissions, and I can transfer files to him on his instance, and he can transfer files to me That's on my awesome. instance. Yeah. And, and that just comes with, with having NextCloud Federation. Uh, and that's just a step in the right direction. It doesn't mean that NextCloud is going to take on different protocols like IPFS or Matrix, but they, they could. They now they have, have the... the they, yeah, they have the chance to because they're federated now. Yeah, they have the paradigm. They, they understand what it is to be federated, and, and I think they've been taking really well to it. I'm interested to see where they go next with that. Um, the cool thing about web 3.0 projects is that they pair just so well together. If you're using matrix, you can store your communications on IPFS and use different lib P2P protocols in order to use that to communicate. There's, there's a lot of interactivity between the projects. There's a lot of cool projects out there, big projects, not small ones, but unlike any other eras of the web, these are being developed in the open, they are being developed with communities, and they are being developed thoughtfully. And I think the adoption rate tells the same story, where there's a, a slow uptake, but I have not seen them lose popularity. It's only going up. It's only going up. This is where we're going, and it's going to take us a while to get here. Here's a quick one for you. How far away? How many years? I don't I know do. Yeah, I know. I know you've answered before, actually, to this question, but I want to see if you haven't. You had an estimate for when you think these will be. So well, my my answer, my good answer, right? My good answer is these are already deployed in the wild, and as such, they are being used for actual purposes right now. That's all I care about, okay. right? Yeah. If, if if they're yeah. generating value already. They're That's good job. enough for me. Let's let's continue to make it better. Let's continue to get more people onto this. Maybe it's not for everyone. I don't know. But it's definitely sure. for me. We hope you, you enjoyed this episode of Arkham Postcast. Thank you. Be safe. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye.